Um, you may have noticed that uh, our program is a little bit changed from a time scale, but we really, really wanted to connect you with uh, some of our uh, most renowned uh, showcases and people who were actually uh, behind it. So, for this panel, we have gathered uh, a distinguished group of people. Uh, it goes from uh, working on uh, city developments or, let's say, parts of city, <laughs> to uh, regional developments. And uh, we will start with our presentations from regions to cities this time, but I will welcome now from cities to regions, this is why I welcome first Thomas Funkleiter from the city of Vienna, please come to the stage, please give him a huge applause. Uh, uh, developing the city from the inside out, purpose-driven enabling spaces is the topic Thomas uh, brings to our conference. I also uh, want to uh, welcome uh, Christian Ballot, also uh, urban development, uh, understanding complex urban systems in order to develop urban design strategies. He's also the editor of Springer series on understanding uh, complexity uh, in urban developments. Please, Christian. Someone who is working uh, with uh, cities all over the world, but also here in the Danube region, with 12 region, is Ramesh Kumar Biswas, Holistic Urban Rejuvenation and Smart Cities. Please, Ramesh. <laughs> and we do have uh, uh, Ray Eisen uh, with us. Ray uh, was also involved, as many of you know, in uh, regional development projects, empirical, theoretical, and systemic design research. How to act in a climate change world. Ray, please give him an applause. <laughs> and last but not least, the president of this year, I to press Oki Bosch, uh, who will introduce the achievements they have done with the evolutionary learning labs in urban and regional development. You will actually start setting the stage. Thank you. Keep them the pause, please. I can't pull this, these things out longer. I'll go down. Um, I only have 10 minutes to talk about a massive big project that we are doing. Uh, so this might look a little bit. Um, I do exactly what I told the students always not to do, and that is don't make your slides busy, don't just give the main points, etc. I'm actually doing everything that uh, I told them not, not to do. Um, anyhow, I, I'm going to start. We have developed an evolutionary learning laboratory. Uh, for the governance of Haiphong City uh, towards a smart city in Vietnam. Now, when you talk there about a city, it actually means the city, it's, it's like the province. Uh, it's more than just the, the physical city in the province. The rural areas, agricultural areas, and, and everything included. So, what I had was this. They have a number of, um, as you can see there, a number of departments, government departments of the city. The big problem they had, and many people this morning referred to that, was that there are 45 meters, or 40, I'm not 100% sure, 40 meters thick concrete walls between the different departments. And in order to develop or to solve a complex problem, there is no way that that can be done without 
people talking across the, those boundaries, or, for that matter, for those boundaries to disappear. Not the departments to disappear, but at least the communication uh, possibilities. So they do their planning each like that, separately. And then they go ahead. And this could be very much, uh, I saw a slide yesterday somewhere, of Vienna, and there's the uh, energy block, and there's a block for traffic, and this and this block for. It's very much the same. Each one of these groups develop their own strategic plan without talking to each other. What we have achieved there was that these thick walls uh, started to disappear through more cross-departmental collaboration um, and the sharing of knowledge which eventually then lead to uh, in, an integrated systemic master plan for the governance of Haiphong towards a smart city. And we use the process of a evolutionary learning lab to do that. And I'm going to show you very briefly how we actually do that. The Evolutionary Learning Lab is a framework to systemically unravel a complex issue such as creating a smart city by use, using processes and systems tools that can be used by everyone, sort of within the theme of this conference. In other words, we have selected uh, through our research those methods that people can very easily learn themselves because the evolutionary learning lab means the people involved in the city in the governance of the city and in all the different steps they have to know how to do it themselves so it's working with them and not for them. The lab also aims to introduce systems thinking, complex decision making, knowledge and, in, and the integration of skills for managers, policy makers and other decision makers. I put that slide in just to show you that is the most important part of this whole thing of the whole evolutionary learning lab is the involvement of people. Everyone is fundamental in finding solutions. If everyone is not involved, it won't happen. Traditional thinking is normally we identify and discuss issues. Then we are talking about solutions, which are normally quick fixes. We implement those, then we reflect on that, and we identify and discuss what went wrong, what didn't work, and out of the air we try and find another way to do things, and that's the normal process known as learning by doing. Try to find out. We have developed a revolutionary new process, a other different process. You, you still see the old one there in blue. But it's actually a new approach to solving complex problems where we put in a step two, three, four, and five. One is to identify the issues. Six is implement the, the um, quick fixes. Seven is reflect. But we put in a step two, three, four, and five. So it's a process that involves seven steps. The first one, identify issues and gather mental models. Develop a shared understanding. And here, all the stakeholders need to be involved. From 
if there's a minister or a director general or whatever you call, from the top management to the people who are actually going to do the work itself. Step two is the most important part of this whole thing, and that is capacity building. All the people involved in this process, they need to understand what they are doing. They must be able to come up with the solutions themselves, because they have to take ownership of the, of the processes, um, uh, and, and the stakeholders changes from passive beneficiaries to active solvers of their own problems. We teach them the methodologies. Uh, the example I'm showing you here is how to develop a course of loop model and how to do Bayesian modeling. Those two things were, we, we found were the easiest for them to actually um, uh, use. When someone gives us a job like this and they want it to be a consultancy, we jump, instead of basic modeling, we jump from causal loop to uh, using I think, for example, um, um, system, systems dynamic modeling. We can also use uh, Malik's uh, Sensi mod uh, in Indus and um, Various other tools, but anyhow, we develop a systems model, so the, the bigger picture. And I say we, it's actually the people who came together, talked about their different, different mental models, and they learned how to develop a model. You can't see it too very well, you don't have to read inside, but they developed this model of how the different things fit together. And then they look for, the next step is to look for the, they explore the relationships, patterns, etc. And then find um, things like uh, environment, economic development, library of people, skill, uh, HR, cross-departmental, coordination, collaboration, and so on, as the leverage points in the system to what's I found it was a smart city. So step four is exploring the patterns and the relationships and understanding what this model. This is an excellent way for the people involved to actually start to understand each other's um, mental models. And because they all come from uh, different uh, angles. Then, if, then they identify the leverage points, as I say, that will have the greatest probability to help achieving the goal. The next step is, of the, is to determine how the identified leverage points could be achieved. So each of those leverage points becomes a goal. And for that we use Bayesian network modeling. We teach them how to do it. It's a very, very simple process and people pick it up within a morning and they can do it themselves. So they make one of those things their goal, like cross uh, department, no, I don't know, say economic development or, uh, or uh, improve the environment or improve the lives of people in this case. Um, then they have a Bayesian model. Don't worry about it. But the only thing for those who don't know what Bayesian models are, it actually identifies uh, those, if you play around with it, it identifies the, main, the most important nodes on that uh, model that will determine the goal. For example, um, Um, it's the dark ones there, and these are the ones that uh, that we see as systemic interventions. And 
and, and we thus identify long-term systemic interventions that they can do. And in this case, they went around and they developed, uh, as I said, there's many steps for and tools uh, for this, but we use basic models. Um, and then they do it for each one. That's what happened in Haiphong. For each one of these uh, leverage points, they actually um, did a model. Then they came together these different, and, and this was another way of breaking down those barriers. They got together and they compared the models and they found that they have the same nodes on, on the different models. Which meant that these models could be integrated into one Bayesian model. Which they eventually did and I uh, won't show that because I don't have time. And then they uh, get all the, the different, um, yeah. Then the next step is to implement these strategies or uh, these uh, systemic interventions and then to reflect and on, on, upon the outcomes of, of whatever they've done. Reflection leads them to improve performance through co-learning again, new issues may arise and the process starts to just uh, continue around and around. That is the learning laboratory process and I'm finished. to be here. Uh, in thinking about what I might say this morning, uh, I, I've always got to consider where I might start out. Uh, and as is my want, I'm going to start at a much bigger picture and uh, uh, I guess challenge everyone here to use, in a way, an adaptation of Donella Meadows' framework and say that everything that's been said here this morning operates within a paradigm and yet we haven't actually took, taken a reflective step back to think about the paradigm of paradigms. Uh, I'm reminded of our uh, IS meeting in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago, in which I had the opportunity to go to the Museum of the American Indian. And uh, it's a great experience if you want to think about how different uh, uh, groups have different paradigmatic assumptions and worldviews. And I guess I'd like to lay on the line that part of what we're discussing here today is a systemic failure of the Western intellectual tradition. That's my starting point. Uh, we live in a period new to human history. If we accept the explanation that we live in a world now where humans are a force of nature and that what we do changes the nature of life on Earth and whole Earth systems, as the claims around the Anthropocene, the Conocene, capitalist scene, whichever scene you wish to work, use, then in theory everything that we have invented to this moment in history is up for critical scrutiny and reassessment because these were invented in a period which we've never experienced before. Uh, of course we won't and ever will throw out the baby with the bathwater but we need to at least contemplate what it means to reinvent reframe and deframe uh, what we do. And I guess I want to invite this particular audience to think first of all about the distinction between the systemic and the systematic. Systemic, interrelated, recursion, circular, systematic, linear, causal effect. And we've seen many examples and we live many examples where the dominant paradigm, that of systematic causality, linear causality dominates. We've had um, examples of that this morning uh, where, and I've spent much of my academic life uh, trying to uh, argue and provide evidence and 
create alternatives to, if you like, the linear models of diffusion, knowledge transfer, technology transfer, and those sorts of models. Uh, the great opportunity, or the, perhaps the only opportunity we as a species have, is to change how we think and act. And so I guess that's the challenge um, that we're planning to address here. I want to, in the idea, in this idea of framing, reframing, and deframing, I want to offer a couple of deframings. Uh, Tansley, in 1933, when he proposed the concept ecosystem in his seminal paper, said, We ecologists need a concept to enable us to do our work. And I propose the concept ecosystem. Yet we live in a world now that imagines that ecosystems are real. And so part of our Western intellectual tradition is to make concepts into artifacts, to entities, to reify them, and then treat them as if they existed all the time. So I want to draw your attention to that historical process of reification, and argue that the only way out of reification is to reintroduce critical participation so that we can undo these concepts at appropriate moments. It's the systemic interplay between these two ideas. I want to also argue that we live in a projectified world and that the institution of the project is part of the issue we've got to confront and uh, uh, it's why we in our work explore ideas like systemic inquiry beginning with uncertainty rather than trying to imagine that we start our activities from a position of certainty. Uh, the other aspect I want to draw attention to and if I ground it perhaps in this the concept of the smart city, and this is part of the reification of, of concepts, we tend to see, see things always in states and in nouns, again a problem of our language, uh, rather than in relational uh, terms. For those of you who may have seen Nora Bateson's video about her father, Gregory Bateson, there's a lovely scene in that movie where he asks a group of people, why is it that we think of our hand comprised of four fingers and one thumb, when in evolutionary terms it was the evolution of an opposable thumb, which is about a set of relationships that are the key issue. It was the relational dynamics between finger and thumb that gave us our evolutionary potential. Yet we imagine these are things. So that's my challenge. And we can begin to think about state, uh, city states or city uh, cities as in relational dynamics, a social system perhaps in relational dynamic with a biophysical system, or an urban area in a relational dynamic with a peri-urban or a rural area, or if you're got it, talking about global uh, footprint and food supplies where so much of, say, European agriculture depends on massive movement of uh, materials from Southeast Asia and uh, South America, etc., in the relational dynamics between this space and other spaces. So, uh, back to Donella Meadows, paradigms, paradigms about paradigms. She then comes down to institutions. I would want to put in my own schema about governance. In understood in cybernetic terms about how we provide feedback processes and enact feedback processes in what I call systemic governing. And to do that we need both praxis, theory informed practical action, and systemic institutions. And um, we've heard many, many lovely examples, including just from Oki, of, of Great ways of involving people, uh, from Rob Dybal, from uh, Fred Marley yesterday, in this integration of tremendously creative and systemic ways of engaging people in the articulation of purpose and of joint action, and we've done a lot of that in our own work ourselves. But I've come to believe that the only way we can make progress in each of those innovations is to embed them within a systemic governance system in which the wherewithal for their ongoing action and evolution is possible through the interplay of appropriate institutional arrangements and or praxis skills. And I want to just cite an example of 
where uh, systems practice in the past, soft systems methodology, was institutionalized in the uh, context of ongoing failure of computer systems or information systems to actually function effectively and massive price overruns. SSM was institutionalized in Britain and everyone who had to develop for government a IT system had to use SSM. The whole thing failed. Why did it fail? Because it became an institutional rule without the wherewithal, the capacity, the embodied practice to enact it. So institutionalization on itself achieves nothing unless you can act it and unless you can adapt it in a design, a systemic design sense to your, your context. And so um, I might um, add further one other idea that systemic inquiry, uh, which flows through from the work of Churchman, Checkland and others, is, a, is an approach that enables us to break away from projectification. And we can sit projects which are systematic in nature with these broader systemic institutions. And I think we have a tremendous need to innovate and build greater systemic institutions at the same time as build greater capability for systems thinking and practice. Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, please hand over to Ramesh. I think you are working on some systemic uh, institutions, so please. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and let me take a, an even greater step back uh, and look at an even bigger paradigm, and that is the city, city, country, or city, uh, urban, rural divide. Uh, every year since I was a student, so that's a long time ago, every summer I read the same thing in the papers that the United Nations has declared that for the first time in human history, more people live in cities than in villages. So this has been going on for about like 40, 50 years, again this year. So uh, this is of course a total misconception and as scientists, if you work with the wrong, uh, if you're given the wrong data or the wrong assumption, uh, then how are you going to come up with a good model? Uh, actually, no, almost 100% of people live in uh, urban areas. They live an urban life. Uh, if you go back to the first cities, uh, starting you know with Mesopotamia, Turkey, China, later on China, Indus Valley, uh, the first cities were evolved from the hunter-gatherer society, where the gatherers uh, the, it slowly work became too much for them. They had to the women had to grow the food, cook the food, re rear their children, look after the livestock and uh, uh, sew their own clothes and everything. So they, that's where the division of labor started and that's where trading and mar the marketplace started. And that, those were the first cities. Now these cities grew and as they grew, uh, there was a need for agriculture, the need for providing food. Now agriculture could still be carried out in the area around these cities. However, animal husbandry needed much larger areas and also water sources. So, people were actually sent out from cities to farm villages. So, when you, uh, how did that went go on? In, you look at Paris, the, the biggest uh, trade fair uh, in the world today is the Paris Agricultural Fair. And that started in the 16th, 17th centuries where people came to the outside extramuros uh, to uh, sell their, not just sell their wares, but their talents. So musicians, poets, artists, uh, craftsmen uh, came there and then the elite from the city went out to hire them. So you came out, the, the magic of the city, the attraction of the city was not, you know, if you, if you, for example, if you lived in a village and you didn't want to marry the boy that your grandmother chose for you and you didn't want to uh, work in your uncle's shop, you had to, and you think you thought you had other potential. You went to the city not just for money, yes, but uh, the money's uh, a factor, but to to realize your potential. What does it look like today in China and in India? What looks like a rural area? Every in every family, there are people who are live, who there's somebody who's working in the city and sending back money. They are producing for the city. The cultural input is television and internet, which is 
uh, an urban product. Um, so the content is urban. So this, uh, so, so actually you're finding the urban rural continuum, which is a much better uh, basis to examine uh, rather than a divide between these two ecosystems uh, as, as they are seen today, urban, rural. So it is one ecosystem, we are living on an urban planet and we've been doing that for centuries. Uh, so, I mean, one has to come away from the image of the Manhattan skyline as the city or the Paris boulevard with the cafes. The city is an indifferentiated one or two or three story sprawl that, you know, joins, it has no end, basically. Uh, it joins what were the earlier urban centers. So, I, uh, so urbanization is in fact, um, uh, the, the fact today is that many of the seven billion people uh, on this planet live in urban areas. More importantly, a greater number of uh, often not living in places defined as cities uh, are directly or indirectly involved in the uh, continuation of the urban, the global urbanization. So uh, I consider the city to be not just a heterogeneous uh, assemblage of accumulated roads, buildings and people uh, in a densely concentrated physical space. But as a social spatial process uh, whose function is predicated upon ever longer and increasingly globalized structures and social metabolic flows which fuses things, which are things, natures and peoples in socially, social, ecological and geographic uh, articulated manners. So my, uh, more, if, if you had to create, I'm not a system scientist, but if you had to create a model, this would have to be like at least five dimensional, you would have the physical dimensions as well as the time and the uh, consciousness, awareness and imagination as a uh, dimension which is uh, exponentially increasing. As you can see, the amount of information and inputs and outputs uh, today, the rate is much higher than it was in previous centuries. So I would uh, suggest this is a, another a different way of looking at the ecosystems of, this, of the planet uh, than the binary or two-dimensional approach. Thank you. And, uh, thank you so much. One. And uh, I hand over to Christian Barot. We might hear a uh, different perspective. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Christian Malo, for everybody who doesn't know me yet. I think uh, that most of you can very well relate to what has been said here by the previous three uh, panelists. Um, okay, it can also be heard in stereo, that's great. Thanks, Stefan. Um, if you can relate to all the things, it's a little bit um, boring. Maybe I'm going to charge this morning in five minutes a little bit. I hope so. Um, from Tuesday morning on with the economic uh, panel to a workshop yesterday afternoon about smart cities to this morning where there was also again a focus on smart cities or vehicles in smart cities. We've had a um, kind of a concentration on this subject and um, looking at ecosystems, I'll also choose to look at the ecosystem, the city. The smart city, what does a smart city do? It should ideally be made smart or be smart because 
we are using our know-how, both the technical one and as well the one about systems, natural systems, social systems, etc. We want to achieve something like a high quality of life for all citizens. And not a smart, smart city where, as uh, shown there, the citizens start actually serving the technology or any other goal. Going back, we want to use our knowledge about systems. If uh, Mr. Weiss, I don't know if he's still here, if he says this morning, we want to have highest quality of life here in Vienna for everybody, and at the same time, he doesn't really know, know how actually to manage the inflow of citizens. There's a lack of understanding of basic system dynamics principles. If you make the highest quality of life here in the city for everybody, of course everybody is going to come here. Whoever has been with us to the MAK, the Museum of Applied Arts, Tuesday evening has seen probably the cartoon on the left side. In our mind is the phone that should please fetch my emails, send this photo to someone. In reality today it's the phone that says like, ah oh, come on, charge me, there is a new email, please read it, answer that call, check in that restaurant or whatever. Similarly today in our mind is the smart city that is depicted on the right hand top side. And the question is, how are we going to make this smart city? A smart city that serves citizens, but where citizens do not serve some smart appliances, etc. And I'm afraid that we are actually going into smart cities where citizens are going to serve something. And it is going to be the case if we are putting smart city design <coughs> under another goal a goal that is different from actually making citizens' life easier and enabling citizens to enjoy life. This morning we learned Smart City Vienna is putting its smart city cityness under the goal of CO2 reduction. We are all going to serve that goal and all appliances I think we can close that too. Yeah. And all appliances, all algorithms, all big data stuff, whatever we're going to do, all technologies, are going to make us serve that goal in one or the other way. You all know Ludwig von Bertalan Fiennes. He said this, human society is doomed if the individual is made a cog in the social machine. And that applies, I think, for any other machine as well, whether this is communism, a church, or the machine of CO2 reduction. This is not our goal on a local level, if we want to make citizens' lives better. And the smart city, uh, coming back to general systems, ecosystems, etc., is just one example. We are now at a crossroads between making and designing a system that forces citizens into a new world machine, or by really understanding systems and gently influencing, allowing for flourishing human society. And I think that's why our approach to smart cities in the next years is decisive. And I'm very happy to discuss this with you. Thank you. Which leads us directly to the topic of purpose. Thomas. Thank you, Stefan. I would like to start with some observations. Um, in, in general, but also in projects, what I see <clears throat> quite often is that um, people tend to um, focus very early in creation processes on technical defects and solutions, so very often they deal with 
call it the, the, the how. So how can we do something? What would be uh, solutions for implementing? Um, as I said already very early in the, in the um, design and the creation process. And <clears throat> an example might be, we <clears throat> for example, you're thinking about a new building, um, developing it or building it, and people already, also it's maybe not defined what actually is happening there, uh, but they're already working on, I don't know, smart, um, smart parking systems. Um, another example would be, for example, I think also the, the whole topic of smart cities. Um, maybe we haven't defined yet what actually smart means for society, but we are really very, you know, investing a lot of money <coughs> and, 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 and thinking about smart energy, smart um, whatever, um, smart electricity and so on. Um, and you can put this on, on, on different topics to say maybe this, you know, developing the car or thinking about mobility. And <coughs> this is also where I want to you know, give a short introduction to, to, to my thinking. Um, I think it's really important to um, start with a with the why, with the what, um, and this usually deals more with the, with the purpose or with goals. Um, we apply this in projects and because we, <clears throat> in the city context, I want to give you one example how we how we are doing this. And um, the, the location is London, it's uh, a, a, not only a building but the whole area, a small area um, next to the uh, most busiest transportation hub in London, it's Waterloo. And we are working together with one real estate developer and the this real estate developer is really keen, very keen on not only developing new buildings, maybe a retail building or a retail um, functions or office functions, but really thinking about what could we, how could we, you know, make a, how could make, how, how can we make a better building? So not just repeating the past, but really thinking about about future future needs, um, getting some activity into the buildings, etc. And what we tried with this purpose-driven approaches, um, and also with the developer at the beginning, it was they were quite driven with thinking about solutions very early in the integration process. And what we tried to do with them is to say, okay, I'm step back. Um, I think first it's important to, to think about the, the area, about the site, not only about the building itself, but really about the <coughs> about the whole area surrounding surrounding this um, building. Um, we called it um, also the workshop purpose of the site and it was very interesting because um, usually they, <coughs> these guys are very operational, they are super fit and do a lot of research with regards to um, quantitative data, like they have all this research about traffic patterns and, and, and market research and so on, but they, what they really like is qualitative data. Um, we cooperated with a design agency in London, um, which, <laughs> which is the only test to work out the atmosphere of the of the area, and this was quite surprising for them, and also very interesting. And for example, uh, in the workshop, what we also did is um, we gave them, we called them activity cards. We said, okay, um, please, um, all the participants go out for for half a day and try to explore the area and get a feeling for the area. And one card I liked very much was, for example, um, it says, um, archaeologists say, um, trash is king. So go and look in the litter and um, try to make some meaning out of it. What does it say about the users? And so we um, generated, I think, about 50 or 60 cards and people were going out and try to think about, or uh, try to fulfill the, the activities on the card. And it was very interesting because this was the first time they did it and it was very insightful because usually they don't work with this qualitative data and what we got in the end after the two, after the two days is really trying to come up with a um, purpose of the site which, which consists of qualities of the area, which consists of potentials of the area and the idea is really to think about um, you know, not think about an individual development within an area, but think about the area and think what is the past and how can we connect this past with a thriving or hopefully positive future. And from this, um, 
statement or foundation of a purpose of the site, <coughs> we went into the next workshop. And what we tried then to do is um, trying to bring in the systemic um, perspective, trying to say, okay, we have the purpose of the site, which is defined or described not in the sense of verbs, but in the sense of nouns, and then think about a transformation or translation of the purpose of the site into a working model for the building. So what, you know, what affords this purpose of the site, what should happen within the building? And this is then not a description of nouns, coming back to you, this is, this are core, we call them core processes. So what kind of core processes um, make up the essence or the core of the building? in the future or should make the uh, should uh, should make up the or should happen in the building. And this is highly linked, like in a coherent manner to the purpose of the site. And obviously you have to take in factors such as um, you know what, what are the targeted users, um, what what kind of um, clients do we expect, etc. Um, what we came up with is they call it a value proposition, but it's actually a working and operational model where you really think about, not in a very detailed kind of manner, what is the, you know, the operational issues on, on a very low level, but really what are the five to eight most important processes on an abstract level which define the essence of the building. And is this transformation from the purpose of the site to a systemic model of interrelationships? Um, the next step is in order to get this red thread through also into programming, architecture, technologies, is to say, okay, the next workshop is what we call requirements or concept. So what kind of requirements are inherent or afford, you know, affords the, the concept or the, the purpose of the site is the core design model, is this interrelated model. And then you have different categories like architecture, social, um, technology, uh, in, uh, innovation and so on, where we really could think from each core processes which kind of um, requirements affords this um, 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 processes which is interlinked with the other processes. And <clears throat> what we <clears throat> try to, you know, to, to achieve with this approach is to <clears throat> start from the, what we call it, from the inside out. So really thinking about the essence, about the purpose of whatever it is, in this case it's a building, um, <clears throat> trying to understand the context, defining or describing the, the essence what's happening there, and from this developing the why, the solutions. But as I said, not at the beginning, but at the end. And um, this leads me to one final remark, but, uh, but, you know, but, but the overall game of this is, let me say, um, from a really deep thinking about the the purpose and the essence of the site, actually want to create uh, what we call enabling spaces. So spaces can be a building, can be an area, can be a city, spaces which um, enable desired processes. And not any processes, but processes which are desirable in the sense of a thriving future, um, coming out of this purpose-driven approach. Not, you know, from, okay, we want to have any, processes because it was a quick brainstorming, but which is really linked to the, to the past, to the atmosphere, to the qualities of the site itself, and then trying to think about how could we take the positive aspects from the site and develop them into, into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, before I open the uh, discussion to the audience, uh, I want to start with one of the questions that came into my mind because of there is some red thread through all the five presentations. Uh, and uh, it starts with Oki's uh, systems thinking for everyone. He claimed it needs everyone to solve the problems or it needs everyone to create uh, this uh, shared understanding and then coming up with uh, possible solutions. And then we heard something about even paradigm change and uh, understanding it in a different way to who is actually uh, um, creating our goals that we then must obey almost, <laughs> if this was the picture, and then the purpose. So, as you five are sitting here, right, and 
you have a lot of experience also in applications as well as in science research. When we are thinking about this notion of purpose and who's creating that purpose then, when we come to a social um, flow that is called the city, right? Who will be, is it everyone? Is it selected ones? If so, on which basis are they selected? Um, do you have a, a stance for that or an answer for that or an, or, an, or an idea? Because of the topic of the conference. Because they, they, those who define the purpose are those who define the purpose not only for themselves. Right? No. Uh, well, we live in a world that's dominated by the idea of us humans as consumers uh, contributing to economic growth. So uh, the, the pathway in surely has to be to reactivate the human as citizen and what it means to be a citizen and therefore the institutions that, su that support particular capabilities, particular actions, particular aggregations, particularly uh, particular concentrations of citizens doing and taking responsibility for their citizenship. Uh, unfortunately, the act of voting is not, in my view, an act of responsibility, uh, uh, particularly in systems like the UK where you have first-past-the-post systems uh, in which a government can, or a 34% of a voting population can decide to leave the European Union. This is a, a ridiculous uh, model of a way in which a citizen they should uh, enact it. And we, uh, we don't pay a lot of attention on citizen eco-literacy. And uh, just one final point on this subject. For those of you who were at uh, IWS last year in Boulder, Colorado, at the University of Boulder, they have a um, planetarium there, and some of us went as guests of Future Earth, a large international consortium and program, to this planetarium and had the experience of being taken through a sort of guided fantasy or a guided trip into outer space, but back, importantly, from space back to our own planet and to see and to experience the dynamics of how many planes were in the sky at any one moment or what was happening with the circulation patterns, the global circulation of particulate matter, black carbon and these other issues, which makes a mockery of the idea that a one city can control its air pollution issues. These are global phenomena. Your point about global ecology is, I think, is really important. So how do, we, how, do we, uh, how do we create the institutional gestalt shift that we can both operate at the local and the global? Um, I'm, I'm going to go a little against conventional political wisdom by saying that I, I believe the elite has a role uh, because politicians today, uh, I don't see the kind of visionary politician who manages to take the risk and do something and it may go wrong but, it, uh, but many, many great things were done like that. Today's politicians are hiding behind polls and, uh, uh, and so-called public participation which is also fairly manipulated and uh, they do it in Vienna too. So it's, uh, I think that, the, and then we've had these elections, you know, like Brexit and Trump and people like that. So who are, who are the voters? The profiles of the voters are, uh, what did Trump say? I love the poorly educated, yeah? So, uh, so there has to be some respect. There was a British minister who said, we've had enough of experts, you know what I mean? Uh, so, but then the experts, yeah, the, the conventional expert, uh, if you remember Edward de Bono in the 70s or even earlier, he said, well, the expert digs a hole and the biggest experts are to be found at the bottom of the deepest holes. But if we change the type of expert that if you're not, uh, you have a general, a general education as well as a specific one combined, uh, then maybe that's the place to start, but it's going to take too long. So that's why we have to start to look at ways to navigate around the silos now before destroying them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who's creating our goals and our purposes, right? So I, I do think we do have lots of very well-established, very well-functioning autopoietic systems out there, whether this is in, uh, 
in science or in politics or institutions, all the silos, most of the silos are very well functioning output poetic, that means self-reproducing systems. And so are most of our institutions actually. They're making our goals because they are working. They're working very well. It's very effective in this. Uh, <coughs> okay. Your view on this. Um, first of all, I think it's not one purpose. I think there are many purposes possible, depending on the culture and the context. Um, maybe, I don't know, a water bottle in the Sahara will be, have a different purpose for someone living there than here. Um, I see the. I see creating a purpose very similar to design processes, and I'm quite convinced that really good design will not be a fully democratic process where everyone can contribute and co-design. I see really that one designer or a core group of designers have to be have to take responsibility and you know be responsible for the design. Also, obviously, they're very good design. They have a very deep understanding of, of users, of user needs, and so on. So it's implicitly in the in the purpose this wider audience. And and for, for the purpose, I see it quite um, um, similar, um, at, at least in my experience, that um, there's only, there are not so many people who really uh, are good at, at um, creating purposes or meaningful purposes. And obviously you have to uh, have to and can check it with, with, with the wider audience and you see um, anyway, you know, you have to do the, the, the testing um, and, and, and if it's not a good purpose, it, it, it will fail anyway. Um, but developing the purpose, I think, as I said, it's very similar as the design process. You have to really have a good understanding of the contributing factors such as context, as culture, as, as user, as user behavior, and so on. It would be nice if you added a few words about what you said yesterday about meaning, not just purpose, but meaning. What did I say? I see purpose very closely related to, to, to meaning, um, yeah, what is, what is the meaning of something. Um, maybe give you another example, um, for, for, for example, for innovation processes, you can, you can start with, um, what, what is the English word for the, for the adding, is it? You know the, the adding, the, the, the pen for the flip charts? Marker? Um, for the marker, yeah, you can, you can start with the, you say, okay, I want to innovate this marker, you can start with this object and say, okay, let's, let's think about how to innovate this, make it thinner, make it lighter, make it more lasting, make it not so, not so, so dangerous, whatever, but still, at the end, there will be always a marker. But I think it's much more interesting to, to start with the thinking from, from the meaning perspective, namely, what is actually the meaning of a marker. And when you start from this point of view, you have a much wider spectrum of possibilities and potentials because then you maybe come up with, and also, as I said, there will not be one meaning or one purpose, but you rather, okay, say maybe the meaning of the marker is to leave traces. And if you start with this search field or with this potential, I think you can, you can come up, at least you have the possibilities to come up with completely new um, you know, uh, novel innovations which are not looking like a marker. I want to ask Christian uh, a question. I want to know what he knows about the killing off of the social autopoetic system. The killing off, the death, how do you create the death of the social autopoetic system? Well, there are two possibilities. Um, one is to start a revolution, right? So it's kind of bottom up. And you just uh, don't follow anymore the, the rules of this uh, social system. So if you don't follow a certain rule, a habit, or you have done things so far, the things become out of fashion and if you start proposing something else or do something else, you can rechange, you can change something. The other thing is that if you are actually somehow in a position to govern such a system, to constrain it, you may change the rules from a political standpoint or so. But that's only if you are actually in a position to govern a system. That's very general, very basic. So open up the discussion. Okay, uh, reply to Stefan's question. I've had Stefan and I have already. Uh, the answer is on the uh, IGLS website, and I think it's a quote by uh, one of our early contributors, uh, the first lady of uh, IGLS, I think. 
Uh, he said a small group of people get together, that's the only way problems are ever solved. Our ideas are So that will be the goal. And my question is this, what if cities just aren't smart? And now I think should be to get rid of cities altogether. Uh, I have a question which is a bit related to what Dennis asked, which is about uh, rurality and urbanity. And, uh, uh, in something in the previous uh, panel uh, struck me about one uh, panelist talking about uh, uh, cars uh, becoming living uh, entities uh, where we spend more time and start living in and would interest architects. So this uh, brought the thought of how about new forms of nomadism. And the other uh, thought was that uh, some cities, and that apparently does not occur in, uh, uh, in Vienna, are trying to build uh, urban uh, food agriculture and like Barcelona, bringing production into the cities through peer-to-peer uh, -peer or do-it-yourself uh, production and creating makers uh, workshops for, for relocating both agriculture and uh, production within the city. So there's a nomadism in on the one side that could be. And then on the other hand, uh, some more localization and how will this affect can we have the first question repeated, please, slowly and clearly? Thanks. The first question was, what if cities aren't smart? And the smart thing is to get rid of cities altogether. <laughs> And um, mine follows on from Dennis's uh, question, what if the nation state is the wrong container and in fact we should be thinking of not the zero-sum approach of competing across nation states, perhaps we should be caring for the planet, caring for country, thinking perhaps of governance for protecting living systems and perhaps thinking about whether technology is really inevitable, um, all these suggestions are really just constructs that perhaps should follow designs that are inclusive and uh, respond to the needs of diverse stakeholders who may see things differently. Hey, I think we should uh, give some time for responding to these uh, three questions. As the almost couple, please, who wants? Hello. To the first question, uh, you can't get rid, as I said, the city, the, the physical space of the city is actually much more efficient in, uh, in terms of using, of, yes, they are the big polluters, but they do use resources much more efficiently efficiently than suburban or rural sprawl, uh, which has an enormous amount of infrastructure and traffic and uh, which is, is incomparable. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a factor of five, I think, in terms of efficiency, in terms of the physical city. But what I said earlier was the city is a state of mind. You can't get rid of that anymore. Uh, just to pick up on Janet's uh, point uh, around the nation state and governments, I can just relate that after the Brexit vote in Britain about a year ago, I thought to myself in a rather depressed moment that, well, perhaps this will trigger changes that are unknowable and unimaginable, and perhaps one of those may be that Britain disaggregates into a set of regional uh, entities, London, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, etc., and that this will be the forerunner of the breakdown of the nation state, which I think is really um, uh, operated for four or five hundred years. It's not that older notion. And uh, I think, in terms of the issues we've got to deal with, 
the boundary of the nation state is something that we need to surpass as quickly as possible. For the first question, um, I think, uh, you know, if you look also at innovation and creation um, activities, there's quite some research on that the city itself produces much more innovations and creativity. Um, so I think as a construct, it's maybe not so bad <coughs> idea, the city. The question is how we design it and if the current city, if this is the best design for bringing people together. general system theory. Now, this system view, the movement, has produced a vast amount of discussion, debate, conferences, literature, and some spread of teaching, but not at uh, school level. It um, has also produced a number of uh, somewhat uncertain, confusing ideas like system thinking, which uh, has produced about a half a dozen or a dozen definitions. Anybody you ask has a different view of it. And uh, quite a number of approaches to uh, uh, this uh, systems uh, structure or system theories. But what I'm saying is that nothing has profound, has emerged. No fundamentals, no unifying theoretical structures in comparison with conventional science of physics. Uh, the question I'm raising is, why is it? Wouldn't it be an idea to look into this question and opening it for debate as to how to progress to the next stage when a more uh, <clears throat> concrete, more down-to-earth, more uh, theoretical structures that <clears throat> can be implemented in operational form, could be constructed. Thank you very much. Hi there, Benkling. I'm observing a blind spot in what we mean by voting. We were with uh, you, Ray Eisen, in Herrenhausen on cyber systemic governance before the IEEE in Berlin. And I think voting implies that we come to informed decisions. And then voting is either influence voting or priority voting. And if you do influence voting, you can establish the meaning, go to the root and deep drivers. The next um, blind spot I observe here is how we do conversations and dialogue. So please help us to improve. Have we identified now some lines that you want to refer to? I guess I have one question. How does your processes take care of such things as failing cities like Chicago? Well, I've, I've heard you ask your question many times, so I'm not going to respond. I'm going to take it as a comment and a part of a conversation over 30 years, so thank you. Uh, I mean, I, and I, uh, I mean, I agree with your, your premise, and uh, I think uh, our process design, and this is what I mean by praxis skills, whether it's systemic design, dialogue design, uh, encountering the other design uh, are skills that 
And I would say that's part of what I mean by citizenship. And it's part of where I would say systemic notions like particularly Ashby's law of requisite variety, that only variety can manage variety, has a relevance to how you reimagine governance. Because in the climate change world that I'm talking about, we can no longer operate with a command and control model. The world is going to deliver far more surprise, far more difference, far more variation and variability. And so we need citizen capability at the right level of requisite variety to deal with that surprise. And so only governance systems that are built around that are going to be able to deal effectively, or at least respond in part to that emergent surprise. And so I think uh, back on voting, I mean, it's fascinating, isn't it, really, that in Germany, uh, I would regard you as having probably the best voting system of many that are around, and it was introduced under the influence of the British and the Americans, but they've not adopted it themselves. And so there's a, there's a sort of failure to learn or a failure to reinvent institutions here. And one final point on this is that I am so angry at the ideological component of the Tory party in Britain who put, imposed on the nation a referendum which was a device to solve political power tensions with inside a party using a device that none of those in government understood how it functioned. They didn't understand the affordances that, that come from a vote in a referendum and how that differs from a vote in an election. And the outcome was, in a sense, quite knowable, but we didn't know enough. Um, maybe a, a fundamental question that I would ask as an outsider uh, to systems uh, scientists is, uh, are you now looking at the in increased complexity of the world and the rate of increase? Uh, and are you, are you not... Um, are you on the right track when you're trying to develop uh, better business as usual? Yeah. Or is it, isn't it better to pick up uh, maybe a completely different model, way of thinking? I think we had something about failed cities or so, a keyword, right? Which, which city lately or which city really failed? Baltimore, Detroit, whatever. Okay, all right. Did, did these cities really, like, did the cities fail? In, in Detroit, car industry went down. All right. So, so um, from a systems perspective, this, the, the city of Detroit was kind of dependent on more or less one subsystem. And I think that with systems tools and even simple system dynamics tools, some stuff that is really pretty old already, we could um, maybe not always avoid it, but reduce the effects and uh, reduce the risk that such stuff uh, happens. So system science could actually help in such cases, yes. But it need to reach government level. No city fails as a whole. There's some, always something that fails in every city in Vienna too. I mean, it, uh, and some there are some success stories. So it's a, a very complex, uh, mixed, uh, and um, you know, with a lot of variety and diversity. So I don't think there's a city that you can uh, describe as failed, except maybe Pompeii. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe one more thing. <laughs> oh, um, we, if you observe, we have developed over the past uh, century a way of preservation, a very strong conservatism. We want to preserve our old city cores, our old houses, our old way of living, our industries, etc. It hasn't been that same that before. And maybe that is also why we perceive stronger such types of failures as failures and not as chances for a new beginning, even if they are sometimes hard.
questions? Yes? Can you can you can you raise the question again? Uh, we weren't able to really. Uh, My question was about uh, new possibilities for nomadism uh, through uh, new forms of, of mobility and, and in particular uh, automatic uh, vehicles and other uh, experiments in other cities to, to have uh, urban agriculture. Uh, vertical agriculture and bringing in very local uh, type of fab lab, uh, small uh, workshop, uh, ear production or, or printer, uh, 3D printing, etc. to bring back into the city the, the production and so to create new resiliences within the city. So this I think addresses the question of uh, uh, are cities so bad that, that we need to get rid of them all together? Well, maybe not. There are other solutions. And how do we balance the whole? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two short comments. The, the, the first question regarding the, the new model for, for adaptability. I don't know, I'm not, not the expert on system science, but what, what um, I see, what's available, um, I think it's not so much a question about new models or a new framework, I think it's rather to really take the system science approach serious in the sense of creating interlinked um, systems which are resilient or which are adaptable. Like, you know, you mentioned Chicago, which is obviously not an adaptable system, um, maybe, yeah, it is in the end, but um, not for those who were involved in the, in the car industry. So I think it's rather modeling um, the parts in a, in, a, in a way that they are adaptable as a system. Um, for, the, for the second um, question, my take on this is what I actually also want to, to, to link with the purpose. I mean, the, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, that there are many possible solutions like um, urban farming, farming and, and um, urban gardening, um, autonomous driving cars and so on. And I think what is really important is to think about what what are your decision criteria. So I mean there are a lot of solutions you can do, but this is what I actually wanted to raise in, in, in what I linked with the, with the topic of uh, with the topic of purpose or meaning. I think you have something meaningful which you can decide against. So possible is everything, but maybe um, autonomous cars is maybe not the best idea because you're not 
working on the topic of mobility, but you are just increasing maybe the car density, which is not desirable as such. But if you don't have this bigger picture behind, then maybe you just do it because it's a solution which makes sense in the, in the short term. Well, I would just like to add, uh, uh, I do uh, urban farming projects in different places and also a desert farming project. Uh, I believe that uh, multi-storied, high-density uh, farming should actually be carried out in the countryside because the existing industrial agriculture which is flat uh, is just as destructive of the environment as cities are, you know, like in terms of pollution, in terms of water uh, and, and, and emissions. So you actually need to build uh, high-rise urban farming, uh, high-rise farming structures in the countryside, not in the cities. Uh, I just want to mention that what, what, what I'm sort of experiencing here is exactly what happens when you have this, this dialogue and when you try to, to break those walls down between different people. One person says, you know, what about urban farming? The other person says, no, it should be there. Th this is exactly what happens. This is the kind of dialogue that eventually people start to understand and then you explain why so on. And, 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 and to say, you know, uh, we work in silence, that's working out. Um, it's not. Because it's inefficient, completely inefficient. Because there are too many things that um, people on the one side is dependent on the other side, uh, or silos. And um, therefore you need, the, the most important thing is to get people to actually communicate with each other. And you need them educated, like learning uh, what systems mean, how does it work, how do I have to think, what's the new way of thinking, and the only way to do that is to do that in a, uh, a group. Uh, Maybe something about uh, adaptation and digitalization and everything? Um, I don't have statistics or a big picture of the world, etc. But what I've observed here in um, Western and also in Central Eastern Europe over the past 10, 12 years is that is enormous uh, adaptation to digital tools. I mean, we are all, almost all, young and old, are using Google Maps today. We are not actually checking the timetable of the bus, of the bus stop anymore. But we know the bus is going to be there in three minutes. So I need a run, yeah, because you have it in real time. Um, and so on and so forth. We're using Uber, we're using Airbnb apps, we're using Adapt or whatever. Everything is just in a couple of uh, years that this came and people are using it. So I'm actually not, not pretty much concerned that uh, we do have a problem with adaptation. Whether that puts stress on us and this is healthy or not, that's a different question. That's a different question. About uh, urban verticality and urban farming, I think that there may be some new transport solutions. They are possible, they are thinkable, they're conceivable. Yeah? that may make it uh, more vertical cities more feasible in the future. Whether we will like this or adopt this is another way, but uh, we will see. Yeah, this is either policy choice or vote of the feet. So either we choose to do this or we are kind of encouraged and educated to choose this. Um, and then the question of whether farming should be in the city or on the countryside, that's really also a question about urbanity. What is the city? And the city is a place where we humans gather together, and that's since the beginning of the city, to be very efficient and very effective in creating new solutions, in new ideas, etc. That's why we also want to come together physically. It's about a city is a big enabling space, ideally. Yeah. Um, so I, I really think, I really think, but, but this is of course my thought, and maybe future will prove me wrong, that uh, farm doesn't really have a place in the city, never, because it's just not going to be creative and productive, and the creation of production is the purpose of the plan. 
us humans coming together in cities. Thank you for your last answer. Please wait a second, a second, a second. As we were talking about meaning uh, purpose uh, at the beginning of our conversation, you will all receive an email by the PhDs who are in the PhD course, led by Rias and, and distinguished colleagues, and they want to know through an inquiry of, uh, I would call it soft data, qualitative data it is, what does the for everyone mean for you as an individual in this society? And you will receive an email. There is a link. Please click on this link. It guides you to a website where there is a very simple form and you just type in what you think regarding the question. They need it. Please support them. They will come up with the results at the end of the conference, if I understood the request correctly. Please support those using digital <laughs> uh, to communicate. I thank you all for your attention. I thank you five wonderful people for being here and sharing with us. And I hope a week we were able to create new relations, which are the most important. Uh, please give them a last applause and then go